Greetings everybody and welcome to Gizmo Labs where I show you all the tips and tricks you need to become a pro at Grounded Playgrounds. Have you ever taken a look at the logic gizmos in the build menu when designing your playground and wondered what the hell do these things do? Or maybe you figured out a couple of them but you want to understand how you can use these things to their full potential. Well, for today's tutorial I'm going to be giving you a step-by-step -step guide how each one of these things works and how you can go ahead and use these to enhance some creations and make your maps even better. So, without any further ado, let's get started! First gizmo that I want to go ahead and have a look at in this tutorial is probably the most simple of the three, and that is the Switch gizmo. Essentially, the Switch gizmo, all it is, is just like an invisible version of a regular switch or pull switch that you can interact with in the playgrounds while in play mode. The difference is, the Switch gizmo cannot be interacted with while in play mode, but it can be interacted with in design mode. So essentially, you can turn this thing off or on while in design mode to go ahead and set a default state for it, However, you then have to go ahead and use other sources to control the switch. For example, the way you would go ahead and turn this on and off and on is you could go ahead and use two buttons in order to do this. So for example, I could go ahead and use a button like this and we can make that one go ahead and activate it. And then I could use another button like this and then I could make that one go ahead and deactivate it. Then to go ahead and check that we have an output, we can go ahead and assign this switch to two different lights. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and first of all, I'm going to find a light somewhere and let's go ahead and say, let's do this one and I'll copy this one over here. And then we're going to go ahead and link the switch to this light and this one. We're going to say that when the switch is on, we're going to turn the light on and when it's off, we're going to turn the light off. And then essentially for the other one, we're going to reverse the behavior so we can essentially turn the light off if we turn the switch on and then turn the turn it on if we turn the switch off. So now what you should see is we can go ahead and do this. And now we've got two buttons to control which light essentially is turning on. Now, if I press the same button multiple times, as you can see, you can see that nothing is changing. So essentially now I've got like a way to control a switch slightly differently. Now, this might be a very simple example, but you can also use switch uh, gizmos to actually save a signal from a receiver. Now, you may have noticed if you've ever tried to link a receiver to another one of the logic gizmos, it doesn't always work. So for example, if I have a receiver here and I wanted to compare what I got with in my receiver with say a switch gate, you'll see that it doesn't actually let me do it because the receiver doesn't hold on to a signal that it fires. Essentially it fires it and forgets about it. So what you can do is use a switch gizmo between a receiver and when you go ahead and do your other logic, which we'll get into in a little bit, and then you can use this to go ahead and turn on the signal once we get a received signal like this, we can activate it. And then when activated, we can just go ahead and say, once it's switched on, we go ahead and evaluate, and then we don't do anything when it's switched off. So essentially then you can then link this into other logic gates as well. So you can get, then go ahead and check whether, you know, you got, re you got signals on several receivers, et cetera, et cetera, in order to go ahead and then process your logic across long distances. Is. So apart from just being a generic kind of switch, the switch gizmo is also good for storing receiver signals. Now you can go ahead and uh, actually I'm going to undo that and I'm going to show you how you could potentially turn it back to default as well. So for example, say if we received a signal and we only wanted the switch gate to hold on to that signal for a few seconds, what we could go ahead and do is we could go ahead and say, right, let's go ahead and put a timer right here. We're going to go ahead and set our timer just to have one second like this. And when the switch is turned on, we're going to activate the timer. We don't want it to stop when it's turned off. And then when the timer is expired after one second, we go ahead then and then we go ahead and deactivate that switch. So essentially we can then make this store a signal for one second to evaluate with further logic down the line. Now, don't worry about this gizmo. We're going to get into that in just a minute, but that's how you could potentially store a signal coming in on a receiver with a setup just like this. Now you could also try another way to go ahead and do this as well. You could maybe use a counter in order to do that, but we're gonna get into that in a little bit as well to see how this is gonna work. But that is essentially a switch, uh, a switch gizmo in a nutshell. Essentially just an invisible switch, just like the player ones, and you have to use other gizmos and gadgets in order to activate them. The next gizmo that I want to look at is this one, which is the counter with condition. 
Now, this might sound a little bit complicated, but don't worry. I'm going to go through each of the, these functions in turn and I'll show you what it does. So essentially, this switch is essentially something that will store a value. And then if that value meets a condition, it will then go ahead and do either one of two things. It will go ahead and do an event if it passes the condition and it will also do an event if it fails the condition. So essentially based on what value is stored in here compared to what we're actually looking for the value to be, you can decide what behavior happens after that. So the counter initially will store a value of zero. And what we need to do is we need to use something to go ahead and change the value of the counter. So we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to go ahead and first of all, put down two buttons right here. Now I'm going to color one of these as I'm going to go color one of these as like a green color and that's going to make the counter go up. So we're going to link this one over here and we're going to make sure this link is set to increment when we have pressed the button. So all increment means is it's going to add this amount to the counter. So in this case, we're choosing to increment the counter by one. So currently it's going to store a value of zero, but if I press this button, it's going to turn that value to one. Now, this one, this red switch here, I'm going to go ahead and make it decrement the counter, which essentially is the opposite. So instead, it's going to take away this amount from the counter. So say if my counter had a value of three in here and I press this button, it's going to take away one and then my counter will store a value of two in it. Now we have a look at the condition. So the condition is that the value in this counter has to be equal to one. If it's equal to one, it passes. If it's not equal to one, however, it's going to fail. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make a couple of lights right here. Uh, we're just going to get a couple of these guys and I'm going to put them somewhat close to our counter. So we're going to say this light will determine if the condition is passed and this light will determine if the condition has failed. I'm going to go ahead and color this light in like a green color to say, yay, we passed. And then this light over here, I'm going to go ahead and color in like a red color to be like, nah, you suck, you failed. So now what we need to do is if the condition has passed in the counter, we're going to say when the condition passes, it will turn this light on. And when the condition fails, it will turn this light off again and to indicate we failed. Now to the failing route, we need to essentially just do something else. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put it into this light here. And then we'll say, well, when the condition fails, we want this light to come on to indicate that we failed. But if it passes, then we want it to go off, right? So we're going to go ahead and turn that light off. So let's go and see what happens. I'm also going to go ahead and put down a score counter so we can keep track of the value in our counter and compare it with the condition like this. So we're going to go ahead and put a score counter kind of like between these lights here. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to make these buttons do the same thing to the score counter as it does with our counter with condition. So this button will increment the score counter and this one will decrement the score counter. So we're just going to make sure that one is set to decrement. And there we go. So now what we can go ahead and do is we'll go ahead and go into play mode. So currently now when we're in play mode, our counter has a value of zero stored inside it. Now, if I go ahead and press this green button, it's going to add one to this counter and we're looking for the condition that the counter value is equal to one, right? Well, that's true, right? So this now is going to go ahead and activate. So there we go. So that means that this has passed and therefore this light has turned on. Now, if I press the button again, it's going to increment the counter again. But this time we're looking for a value in our counter equal to one, but the value of two is not equal to one, right? So therefore it's going to go ahead and turn on this light because the condition has failed. Now, if I keep pressing this, you can see that it's going to keep failing because none of these numbers is equal to one. But if I go back down to one by decrementing it, there we go. This light goes ahead and passes again. If I go back down to zero, then you can see that zero isn't equal to one, so it fails. You can also change the value of the counter to be a different value. So for example, you can see that we could also make it go ahead and be equal to say three, just like this. Now, if we go back into play mode, well, first of all, if we press this button, right, it should go ahead and then turn this red light on. Let's have a see. Does it do it? Ah, well, why has that not turned the red light on? What we need to do is in the counter, there are two modes of evaluation. We can evaluate it when the condition changes, i.e. when you go from a fail to a pass or a pass to a fail, or you can set it for when the value changes so that every time that counter changes, it fires an event. Currently on condition changes, it's only going to fire the first event when we have a number equal to three. So what you'll see 
is currently this counter is set to like nothing or failed, right? So we haven't met the condition yet. We still haven't met the condition, so we haven't passed an event. We don't have a condition change. Again, we don't have a condition change, so the event doesn't fire. But now we do, right? So now it goes ahead and does that. Now if we press it again, so currently now we're in a state of pass. But if we go ahead and do it again, we then change our condition from pass to fail, and therefore this red light does turn on now. And now if we go backwards, you'll see there's a condition change, so now the green light goes on, and there is another condition change, because now it's not equal to three, and therefore the red light goes on, just like that. And now the red light stays on when it should have been on before. So how can we fix that? Well, essentially, if we change this to, instead of being evaluating on a condition change, it will go ahead and change when the value of the counter changes. That way, we can go ahead then and say, oh, okay, now it's on a value change. So every time we press any of these buttons, it's going to fire an event to both of these lights to say that it's passed or failed. So now what we should find is now when I press this green button, that red light now should go on. And there we go. So now it says, okay, well, the value is now one. We've had a value change. So evaluate is one equal to three. No, it's not. So it's failed. And again, it'll go ahead and do that. And now you can see that every time I'm trying this, it's evaluating on a value change. To make this a bit more clear, I'm also going to go ahead and link this to an effect spawner as well. So I'm going to go ahead and put a couple of effect spawners here just so we can see when it's evaluating the different conditions, because that will make it very, very clear for you to see. So I'm going to go ahead and put an effect spawner kind of like over here like that and then i'm going to go and link this in and we're going to say whether it passes or fails we just want to go ahead and display this effect and i'm going to put the effect thing right in front of there so now let's go set this back to condition changes and you'll see why why this happens now so you'll see that currently the condition hasn't changed so nothing's going to happen but now because we've gone from nothing to a true the condition changes and that light comes on now again, we're going to change the condition when we go from true to false. So the light goes on again and you can see that effect happens. But now you can see if I keep pressing this, that effect spawner is not playing my raw science effects. So it will only happen when it goes from a fail to a pass or a pass to a fail. But if we go ahead and set it on a value change like this, so here we go. So now we'll go and set it to value change. You'll see now that with every button press that's altering the value, it will go ahead and play this now. So if I go ahead and set this now, we can go ahead and see that now it's doing it on every change and it will evaluate every single time, which is pretty good. Now, as well as incrementing and decrementing a counter, you can also make a button that resets a counter. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make a third button. And I think I'll put it on the very left here. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this to go ahead and set a value. Now, set value essentially is just going to let you directly put a value into that counter. Whatever the value happens to be, if I press this button, the value is going to get set to that. I'm also going to do the same for this as well. So I'm going to go ahead and use a set value on here. And then I'm going to change this button to a different color so we know it's our reset button. So this purple button is now our reset button. So here we go. So what we should find now is if I go to one and then if I press set value to go back to zero, as you can see, the condition is still failed. So nothing's changed. However, if I go, um, okay, let's set to zero. If I go to say like four, I can also just go ahead and set the value to zero, just like that. Now, the thing is, if we're on that level three, where the condition is true, and I go set value to zero, you can see that even though there was a value change, the counter did not actually fire an event this time. Now, why is that? Honestly, I'm not sure, but that's the way the counter acts. But how can we get around that? There is actually a way to do it to make it so that when you set a value directly, you can make the counter at least fire an event still to update anything on the receiving end. Now to do that, all you need to do is instead of setting the value that you want, so currently we're setting it to zero, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set the value to one higher than the value that we want. So we're gonna set it to one, and then we're going to fire a decrement like this, which will then go ahead and set it to one, decrementing it back down by one, and therefore it will go ahead and result in zero, right? So essentially we're making sure that by doing this, it will fire, because the increment and decrement are the only things that fire a value change event in the counter, but set value does not. Now I'm not sure if that's a bug or how that currently acts, but by doing this, you can ensure that you will fire an event. So now what should happen is if we go into a counter, I'm gonna go ahead and increment to three. You'll see that now when I do my set value in my reset, 
it does fire an event and it does then re-evaluate this counter to false. Now you can go ahead and use these in any way you like. You can link several counters together to perform different things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of how you can use a counter setup to go ahead and do some cool stuff with a creature spawner. For the next example, I want to show you how we can go ahead and use the greater than and less than in a counter with condition, just like we've used the equal to with this one. Now, before I go ahead and actually make this example, I'm going to go ahead and show you what this looks like right here. So let's go and change this one from equal to three to less than three. Now, this is a strictly less than three. So essentially, this counter will now only return true for values zero, one and two, because three is not strictly less than three, right? So three is actually you know equal to three. So therefore, if we're looking for anything less than three, this will return false. So if I now go into here, let's go ahead and just press this to you know start our reset off. If I go ahead and start incrementing the counter, you can see now that this evaluates to true currently because we're less than three. Now two is less than three, but now if we go to three and then anything higher than that, it's going to go ahead and evaluate to false. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and reset that. You can see also my reset thing is not actually triggering the uh, counter to reset right there. And I think that's because we've used a, uh, did we use a set value here? Yeah, we actually used a set value and then we didn't put an increment down here. So we want to go ahead and set a value of one and then decrement by one to make this counter go ahead and fire an event properly. There we go, so that will, that will fix that little bug right there. So now if we reset it, it should fire this to go, yeah, okay, zero is less than three, very nice. And then we can go ahead and put it up. Now you can also go with greater than as well, which essentially is the opposite. So now if we go for greater than three, um, we're gonna go for this one. This is gonna say that zero, one, two, and three are all not greater than three, right? So if we now start, it's gonna go ahead and show false at first until we go ahead and increment it and then once we get to something that's greater than three such as four it will then tick over to true and say yep all these values are greater and it will process the stuff on this green light path so let's go ahead and use this less than and greater than knowledge to make a counter that's going to spawn in a few enemies sequentially over time the first thing we want to do is of course get our creature spawner set up and decide what we're going to spawn so i'm going to go in here and i think we're going to spawn in a taste tea we're just going to spawn in one of these now what i want to do is go and set up a timer and we're going to go ahead and set this to one second start on play and repeat and essentially this thing is going to repeatedly try and spawn a bug every second now the spawner works essentially by only allowing something else to spawn if the previous thing that it spawned has already been taken out so if you spawned like 10 mites in order for it to spawn another 10 mites you have to take out those first 10 mites and that's the way this one will work for this taste tea so in order for a second one to spawn i'm gonna have to kill that first one now what this is going to do currently is if i go ahead and come into here it's going to go ahead and just spawn this guy in and then as soon as i kill that one it's going to go ahead and spawn in another one right so and it's going to essentially keep doing this forever and ever and ever and of course we might want to go ahead and limit that behavior somehow so how we go ahead and do that well we can actually use our new counter with condition to go ahead and set a value so let's go ahead and do this so we're going to put down a counter with condition and every time we've killed this uh taze t this is going to go ahead and increment this counter by one and what i want to do is i want to have this thing continually spawn stuff as long as this counter is less than two, right? So as long as it's less than two, uh, or actually less than three, then we're gonna have this thing spawn in stuff. So therefore we need something to be greater than two for it to stop spawning, right? So once this counter gets to greater than two, which is gonna be three or higher, then it will go ahead and stop spawning. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna link this to our timer and we're going to say that when the counter is greater than two, which means the condition is passed, we're actually going to stop that timer. And then when the condition's failed, we just don't want to do anything. Otherwise, it will stop the timer too early. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make it just play a nice little effect once this has also happened as well, just so we know that the spawning is over. So let's go ahead and put an effect spawner down at the back of this. I'm going to link these guys up and then we're going to change this effect to the... Let's go for the uh, mixer explosion right there. And then we want to make it so that when this condition is passed, i.e. when we have three or more, this is going to trigger. So essentially what we should be able to do now is when we go ahead into play mode now, it will spawn in three of these guys. So there's the first one. Here's the second one. And it should spawn in the third one. Let's go and take this guy out. 
and there we go it's now gone ahead and done a little explosion and no more things are spawning so that's how you can use the counter with condition to make a limited type of spawner so you can essentially limit the amount of ads you want to spawn in for example at any given time you could use this for a lot of other things but that's just one very basic example of how you could use a counter with condition just like this for the final gizmo in this tutorial i want to go ahead and look at the switch gate now this one is probably the most complicated one at least for new people who have come into this thing for the first time. However, it's actually not as complicated as you may think. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a load of switches here and I'm going to get these uh, these pull switches and we're going to make four of these things right here. We're going to put these all in front of this like that and then I'm going to go ahead and link each one of these to this. This is going to be the inputs into this gizmo. So these are our inputs. Now, what this gizmo does essentially is it looks at all the inputs and see if they meet this condition. And if it does, it then fires a true value to the output. And if it doesn't, it fires a false value. So what we're going to do is we're going to get another light because, you know, the light's like the best thing to reflect whether something's true. So we're going to go ahead and get a light right here. We're going to get a plant lamp and we're going to go ahead and link the output of this to this light. So essentially when we when the condition is true and when it's passed, we're going to turn the light on. And when the condition is failed, it, we're going to turn the light off. So let's go and see how this works. Currently, as you can see, this is set to any. So the comparison we want is any. And what this means is when we have any activated, this means anything that's connected to it as an input, at least one of these things have to be turned on for it to pass a true signal to this light. So essentially what this means is if I go ahead and turn on any one of these switches, that light will turn on. So if I go and turn on this one, as you can see, that light turns on because it says it says any of these things need to be on for it to go ahead and turn on the light. And there you go, there it does. So if I turn on two of these things, it will also keep that light turned on. In fact, I can turn on any three of these or all four. As long as any one of these things is active at one time, this light will work, as you can see. So that's the, that's the operator in any. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and switch out of this and we're going to change this now. So we're going to go ahead and change this now to all. So when we go ahead and change it to all, essentially what this means now is in order for this light to turn on this time, all four of these inputs must be turned on. So if I go ahead and just turn on one of them, you can see nothing happens. If I turn on, say, three of them, nothing happens. The only time this light will activate is when all four of these inputs are turned on. And as you can see, there we go. All four of these inputs are now turned on. And then as you can see, this light now turns on right there. Let's go ahead and look at the next one. So there is two more modes we're going to look at with this one. We can also go ahead and look at the at least. So the at least allows you to specify a value. And essentially, this acts very similar to the any, but it will mean that you have to have at least X amount of these switches turned on. So if I put this to two, like this, it says, now I need at least two of these inputs to be true for this thing to go ahead and turn on the light. So let's go ahead and try this now. So now if I turn on any of these two switches, it doesn't matter which ones, you can see the light is on. If I have more than two on, well, three and four are at least two, right? So that means this will still turn on. And as you can see, it works with any two. But as soon as I turn it down to one or none, it's not going to go ahead and turn on the light. So any two of these things will allow this light to turn on. And finally, we've got the last mode here, which is just called only one. So here we go. So we're going to go only one right there. And essentially, this means only one of these inputs can be active at a time. If any more or any less than one is active, this light will not turn on. So let's go ahead and try this now. So as you can see, we just want only one of these to be active. So right now, only this one's active. So that light works. Only this one's active, so it works. But if I put two on now, as you can see, the light goes off because this thing is looking for only one of these things to be active. Now, finally, there is a switch inside here that is called the not switch. So if I go ahead and look inside here, you can also see that I've got a not thing here. So if we go ahead and do turn this one on like this, you can see now that this says not any. So what this means is this light will come on as long as not any of these switches are active. So this means if none of these things are active, we'll have to fire an event at first, of course. If none of these things are active, you can see now that the light turns on. So essentially, this requires all of them to not be active. However, 
if we have um, if we have one or two or more of these things active, the light will stay off. So essentially, all not does is it reverses the uh, it reverses the signal essentially. So if you had it in any, that means any of these can be active and the light do goes on. But if you put it into not any, it means any of the switches are active and the light goes off. We can also do not all. So this is another one. So not all essentially means that if we turn this on, this means we can have nothing active for the light to be on. We can have one active, we can have two active, and we can have three active, but not all of them can be active. If all of them are active, then the light actually goes off. So as you can see, this behaves exactly the opposite to all. All right, let's go ahead and look at the next one. So then we've also got the at least. So this one was saying not at least two. So that means essentially at most, it's going to be at most one, right? So this one's a bit of a this one's a bit of a mouthful, but let's go and see how this works. So as long as I have none of these things active or one of these things active, it's going to go ahead and keep this on. But if I do have two, as you can see now, because we don't want we do not want at least two, that means the light will go off. So essentially, this works the opposite way to at least two. And finally, we've got the last one here, which is just called not only one, right? So if we go and change it to not only one, let's see how this works. Well, if we have only one of these things active, as you can see, the light will stay off. However, if we have zero active, the light will actually turn on because zero is just not only one, right? Now, if we have two active, of course, two is not only one of these things, so the light will go on. And then if we have three or four. So essentially, that one is a little bit of a weird one and you'll probably very rarely use that one. But yeah, that's how the not only one works. Now what I'm going to do is going to go, I'm going to go ahead and show you how we can use some of these gizmos together and see how we can make a little bit of a circuit here so you can kind of get a feel for how all of these are going to work together. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make a couple of things to go ahead and link some stuff together. So what I want to do is let's go ahead and put down a couple of creature spawners. And first of all, I want to go ahead and say that I only want a light to come on when both of these creatures have been killed from these spawners. So again, let's go ahead and set it to something simple. We'll set one to a taste T and we'll go ahead and set one to an arc R and then we'll go ahead and just use a button to spawn these things in, right? So we're gonna use a button right here and we're gonna go ahead and press that one and press that one and that will go and spawn in these creatures. Next, what we're going to do is we want to make sure that both of these things have been taken down, right? So you might think, oh, OK, so to check that both have been done, we could go ahead and use a switch gate like this. However, you'll find that you cannot link one of these directly into a switch gate, unfortunately. However, what we could instead do, we could go ahead and maybe use some switch gizmos between these. Now, there's actually several ways to do this, but we could use some switch gizmos between these. And when one of these creatures gets killed, it will flip on this switch gizmo, right? So what we'll do is we'll set it to when it goes ahead and we have all the creatures killed, it will activate each of these switch gizmos. So we'll go ahead and do that and we'll go ahead and do that one. So we'll make that one activate as well. Uh, I'm going to move that very slightly so the arrow shot nicer. Then we can actually link the outputs of those switch gizmos into a logic gate, right? So we can link it into one of these switch gates right here. And now what we're going to do is we only want a light to come on if both of these creatures have been killed. Essentially, if both of these switches are on. Now, remember, these switch gizmos essentially act like invisible switches. So you can think of these as like levers, but the levers are turned on when the creatures get killed, right? So then we can go ahead and set this to all. And then if we've gone ahead and killed all these guys, we can go ahead and turn on a light, right? So let's go ahead and uh, get a light. I always struggle to find the tab for that one. So we'll go ahead and turn on a light right here. There we go. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to make it so that a light turns on from each of these switches as well, because then we can kind of see which of these switches are active. Even though they're invisible, we can use a light to see which one. So if we just link each of these switches to a light like this, and we'll link each one to one like that. Essentially, when we kill this Taze T, this light will turn on. When we kill this Arc R, this light will turn on because it activates this switch here. And then when both of these switches are active, which means both of these guys are dead, it will go ahead and turn this one on. So let's go ahead and see how this works. So now we're going to go into here. We'll go ahead and spawn both of these guys in. There we go. And now let's go ahead and kill this one. There you go. As you can see, that guy is dead. And now we're going to do 
is kill that one. And as you can see, that guy died. And then, because that guy died, that light went ahead and turned on, which is awesome. So as you can see, the all thing will go ahead and wait for both of these switches to be on. And when it does, it will go ahead and evaluate it. And then it will go ahead and turn the light on again. Now, the other thing I, I do want to do is make it so that if I press this button, it's going to turn off these switches, right? Because if we respawn some stuff, then all the stuff here hasn't been taken out. So I'm going to go ahead and link this button into both of these switch gizmos right here. So we're going to link those together. And then I'm going to go ahead and essentially make it so that it will turn off. So this one here is going to go ahead and deactivate the switch right here. And this one, this one right here will go ahead and deactivate the switch. So essentially this will let us reuse the circuit. So what we should find now is if we go ahead and do this, I can spawn in my creatures. There we go. And let's go ahead and do this. All right, here we go. There we go. Now both these are on, but if I go ahead and reset it, you should see everything turns off again because the new creatures spawned in. So there we go. And you can see this will essentially work like it did before. This time I killed the Arkar first. And there we go. As you can see, it works great. Now, what's going to happen if I want to make it so that I need to do this process twice before a door will open at the end? Let's go ahead and see how this is going to work. So let's go ahead and put a door at the end. And we'll just for j just to save a bit of time, we'll pretend it's already locked, right? So we'll pretend that there's a locked door at the end of this. And what we want to happen is we want it to go ahead and say when we've pressed this button twice and killed all of those waves of creatures, it's going to go ahead and then open that door, right? How will we do that? Well, what we could do is we could take a counter with a condition from this all um, from this all gizmo right here. And then every time that all thing evaluates to true, we can increment that counter by one. And when it's equal to two, we can then go ahead and open the door, right? And we also want to ch check that on value changes. So what we can do is I'm going to remove this light right here and we're going to go ahead and move this just over here, just like that. And then I will do this. There you go. And then we can go and keep the lights there. And then we'll go ahead and link this all gizmo to this. Now, when the condition is true, we want to increment the counter, which is fine. However, when it's failed, we don't want to do anything. So make sure that one is set to none. Then all we've got to do is go ahead and set this counter to this door. And then we just want it to go ahead and, well, if the door is locked, we want to unlock the door and then open the door. And then we don't want it to do anything if the condition fails because it already starts as failed. So now, as you can see, we've used all three types of these logic gizmos to make a bit more of a complicated setup. So now we have to go through both waves of creatures before this door will open. So we now have to go through two waves and then the door will go ahead and open. I also want to make it as well. We could also make it as well that this button does not activate as well. So there could, we could go ahead and make this button D activate but i'll let you work out how to do that using some of this so if you want to go ahead and try and make it so that this button can only be activated twice so essentially spawning in these two waves go ahead and give that a try and see if you can come up with something and if you do let me know how you did it in the comments but what we should find is if i go ahead and do this now i'll press this and it will spawn in my creatures right so i'll go ahead and grab this guy there you go there's one and there we go and spawn you and there we go so as you can see, we've done it once. Now I'm going to go ahead and do this again. And we're going to spawn our second wave of creatures in. And let's try and avoid that as well if we can. So I don't actually have any armor right now. There you go. Tasty is down. And there we go. Arca is down. And as you can see, that went ahead and opened the door. Because every time we reach this logic gizmo right here and it evaluated to true, it then incremented that counter by one. And then, of course, we had to repeat the process twice. And then it went ahead and opened the door. And there we go. That's a little example of how you can use all of these logic things together in one go. And with that, guys, that comes to the end of our tutorial on the logic gizmos. Now, I have also done another video based on the randomizers as well. So if you're wondering why I didn't cover the randomizers in this episode, that's actually in a different tutorial. And I'll go ahead and put a link to that in a pinned comment at the top of this video. So be sure to check that one out if you haven't already, because that will also contain some info on how you can use the randomizers and mix it up a little bit with some of this logic to give your playgrounds a little bit more randomness. But 
as per before guys if you enjoyed this one please let me know what you use this to go ahead and create in the comments and if you want any maps to share with me so i can go and have a head and have a look at them please go ahead and let me know and of course if there are any other tutorials you would like to see as part of this gizmo lab series please go ahead and let me know that as well because i would love to go ahead and make more of these to help you guys make all the maps you want to go ahead and do in grounded playgrounds but guys that's going to be all from me thank you so much for watching and i'll catch you guys in the next one so until then bye